What do we want from a theory of conceptual engineering? Conceptual engineering is largely concerned with what is colloquially called meaning change. Words appear to change their meaning with time. It's common to say things such as, marriage once meant something close to a civil partnership between a man and a woman, but now means something closer to a civil partnership between adults of any gender. Up until the relatively recent past, many of the dominant legal experts in the United States claimed that according to the meaning of the word rape, spousal rape was not rape. Today, of course, we believe that the meaning of the word rape is such that it includes spousal rape in its extension. The words woman and man also appear to have undergone meaning change, with the result that these words no longer simply refer to biological females and biological males respectively. The motivation behind the belief that words change their meaning is simple. In the past, we would use a particular expression to refer to something, and in the present, we appear to use the same expression to refer to different things, things that we wouldn't use that expression to refer to in the past. I want to take a moment to introduce some important terminology regarding words and their meanings. I want to talk about what a referent, an extension, and an intention are, and I want to introduce the concepts of co-extensionality and co-intentionality. The referent of a word is the thing in the world that the word refers to. For instance, the noun phrase, the bus, refers to the relevant bus. The extension of a word is the set of things that the word refers to. The extension, the extension of the word bus is the set of all the things in the world that are buses. The intention of a word is the property that all the things in the extension of a word have in common. The predicate elongated automobile that is not a limousine that is designed to transport many people and the predicate bus are co-extensional, meaning that they basically refer to all the same objects in the world. These predicates are not co-intentional, however, since the property of being an elongated automobile that is not a limousine that is designed to transport many people is not the same property as being a bus. Similarly, to use Bertrand Russell's favorite example, human being and featherless biped that is not a plucked chicken are co-extensional. These predicates both refer to or pick out the same set of things in the world, but they are not co-intentional since the property of being a human being and the property of being a featherless biped that is not a plucked chicken are not the same. Many of those who think that the meaning of a word can change over time are arguing that the words extension and intention change, and that this change is constitutive of a change in meaning. Proponents of such a view would claim, for example, that in the past, the word woman had an intention and extension that is different from the intention and extension that the word has today. That is, they argue that in the past, the word woman referred to a different set of things in the world than it currently does, and that this difference is explained by a difference in intention. It is obviously true that the extension of a word changes with time. Every time a woman dies, the set of women, or the extension of the word women, shrinks. There's one less thing in the world that the word woman refers to. However, for the intention of the word woman to change means that the property that is common across the set of women, the thing that makes them women, changes. To say that the meaning of the word woman has changed is to say that its intention and extension have changed. The extension of the word woman, say 100 years ago, was the way that it was because the property common amongst all women was being a biological female. To say that the intention and extension, or meaning, has changed is to say that today, the shared property amongst all women is something different than their biological femininity. It is this difference that accounts for the fact that the word woman refers to some biological males. I want to reject this view of conceptual engineering. I think that words have their intentions and extensions essentially. I think that words cannot change in their intentions and extensions. Here's what appears to be the case. Words, say, for example, the word marriage, have an extension and intention W and X at one point, then in the future, that word has extension and intention Y and Z. For a word to change in its intention and extension in such a way is for it to change in its meaning. Meanings, I argue, are essential to words. Part of what makes a word the word that it is, and not some other word, is its meaning, or rather, its intention and extension. So to say that a word has changed in its meaning would be to say something like that it became another word. 
But words are not the kinds of things that can simply just become other words. This is nonsense. Instead, a promising line of argumentation is that when it appears that a word has changed its meaning, a new word has been neologized that shares an articulation with the old one. For example, one could say that the word marriage used 100 years ago and the word marriage used today are different words with different meanings that simply share an articulation, just like how the words bank, meaning financial institution, and bank, meaning riverside, are different words which share an articulation. The idea is that the word marriage used today was neologized or created in the recent past and was fixed with the meaning that we commonly associate with it today. The word that we use today is therefore a different word than the one that was used 100 years ago, though they share a spelling and pronunciation. The neologizing argument has problems, however. Recall that this line of argumentation claims that the word marriage that we use today in an inclusive way means something different and is a different word than the word marriage used 100 years ago in an exclusive and homophobic way. Proponents of this neologizing view are claiming that queer couples today are not married in the old and historically significant sense. They're claiming that queer couples are married only according to the meaning of the newly neologized term marriage. This is rather unsatisfying. When gay rights activists were fighting for marriage equality, they were fighting for marriage equality. They wanted to be able to stand in the same relation to one another that straight people could, namely the marriage relation. The neologizing view says that we have two words, both pronounced marriage, one of which refers to what is traditionally conceived of as marriage, and the other of which refers to some newly conceived relation that queer people can stand in as well. We should aim for a theory of conceptual engineering that assures that we're still talking about the same words or concepts before and after they supposedly undergo a change in meaning. My view avoids the pitfalls of the neologizing view and still manages to explain the difference in our usage of words like marriage over time. I claim that word meanings are stable. They do not change with time. What does change with time, however, is our grasp of a word's meaning. What accounts for the change in which the word marriage has been used over the past hundred years is the fact that we have simply learned more about what marriage is and what sorts of things the word marriage refers to. For instance, we have learned over the past hundred years that queer people can be married, so we have learned something new about the meaning of the word marriage. We have adjusted our usage of the word to reflect our improved grasp of its meaning. Words don't change in their intentions and extensions at all. We just improve our grasp of their meaning. My view, therefore, claims that queer people are married just in the same sense that straight people are married. Queer couples and straight couples are both married in the same sense. It just took the rest of the world an unfortunately long time to figure this out. My view, I argue, has the benefit of both sitting nicely with widely accepted views on the metaphysics of words and avoiding unintentional but deeply troublesome political implications.